Greetings to everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Muradian and his team at Lorison University, as well as the TLC Management Board and all others involved in organizing this conference for bringing members of TESOL translation studies and English language literature communities in Iran together in this wonderful event. It's a pity that I cannot physically attend the conference, but it's a privilege that I've been given the space to share my thoughts and ideas with you through a video presentation. As the title of my presentation shows, I'm going to focus on how the process of identity construction can be facilitated in TESOL teacher education from a community of practice perspective. Teacher identity has been defined in different ways. Simply, it's an answer to the questions like, who am I? What kind of teacher do I want to be? How do I see my role as a teacher? And because identity is such a dynamic construct, some say that is actually an answer to the question, who am I at this moment? From a sociocultural perspective, the process of learning to teach is believed to be a process of identity construction through engagement in social interactions that happen within teacher education programs and in the workplace. Um, many studies have been done on the process of identity formation in teacher education. Um, these studies have shown that certain activities in teacher education contribute to the process of identity development, such as on online communities, group meetings, action research, paired placements, and critical reflection. These studies have adopted different theoretical lenses. Some have used sociocultural theory, some have used activity theory, and some have adopted communities of practice, which is actually the perspective I'm going to draw upon in this presentation. However, the thing is that when you look at the studies which have used communities of practice, they've actually used it as an analytical tool to explore the process of identity formation. However, in this presentation, I'm going to actually use it as a guide for re-theorizing teacher education as a space for identity construction. Communities of practice was proposed by Wenger, and a community of practice is defined by him as a group of people who are mutually engaged in a joint task, using and developing a shared repertoire. Let's take a teacher education course as an example. So teacher education, a teacher education course would be a community of practice. And the joint enterprise they're involved in is a process of learning to teach. And the repertoire they draw upon and also develop along the way would be the textbooks they use, the routines they go through, lectures, and everything. In communities of practice, learning is defined as membership in a community which involves negotiation of meanings. And meaning is defined as simply our everyday life experiences. In this process of negotiation of meaning, Wenger believes there are two fundamental processes or components. One would be participation and the other reification. Participation is the social experience of our membership in a community and actually our involvement in social activities together with the other, with the other members of the community. And reification is the process and product of giving forms to meanings. For example, in a teacher education course, um, teacher learners are asked to write an assignment, to write an essay. So they've got certain thoughts that they put on paper. So those thoughts are given a form. This process of putting those thoughts into the form of an essay is reification. And the essay itself is also a reification, which is a product of that process. In the, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to actually use these two fundamental components as the underlying categories of how I'm going to re-theorize teacher education. I'm going to use reification to redefine content of teacher education, and I'm going to use participation to look at how interactions happen within and beyond a teacher education course. Let's start with content. When you look at the literature on content, Quite surprisingly, you see a lack of focus on the content of teacher education. Many people talk about how interactions should happen in a teacher education program, but not much could you find on how we should develop and select the content of teacher education. 
and people tend to assume that the content of teacher education is the textbooks produced by scholars and teacher educators' lectures. And when you look at the literature on negotiated curriculum, you see that teachers are encouraged to negotiate content with their students. They are also encouraged to actively contribute to the curriculum and classroom content. However, there is little, if any, literature on negotiating the content of teacher education with teachers themselves, which is a paradox, because teachers are encouraged to give their students voice in terms of content in their classes, but they themselves are deprived of such voice in the teacher education programs of which they are students. When we look at the uh, concept of reification from a community of practice perspective, we see that there is some potential in there for us to be able to redefine content of teacher education and to put major focus on the negotiation of content in teacher education. Let's go back to the concept of reify because that's a bit complex. So if you look up the word reify, you see in the dictionary it has been defined as regarding something which is abstract as concrete, or what Wenger himself says, giving a form to a meaning. And reification is both the process of doing so and the product of it. There are certain assumptions that Wenger proposes with regard to reification. He says that reification does not necessarily happen at the planning stage of a practice because it can also capture all those moments of engagement in practice. In a teacher education course then, content is not just textbooks. It could be a teacher educator's comment. It could be teacher learners' feedback. So those are also regarded as content. Another assumption that he presents is that although a great portion of reification or content comes from outside the community, in the case of teacher education, it would be um, textbooks, still, members of the community, and in the teacher education course, teachers or teacher learners, reappropriate that content. That is, they just don't take it for granted that they can trust that content as totally accurate, as totally applicable to their local context of teaching. They still reappropriate it. They adopt it and adapt it. The other assumption that he makes is that well, for members of a community to be able to participate adequately in the practice of that community, they need to be given access to different types of reification or content. So in a teacher education course, if we want to negotiate content with student teachers or teacher learners, we need to provide access to books, to the internet, to different websites that they can benefit from to be able to contribute to content development and selection in the teacher education course. So based on these assumptions, now we are going to ask these very simple questions once more. What is content and what does it mean to negotiate it? So the traditional conception of content in education generally and in teacher education is the expert knowledge that is transfer, tra transferred actually to trainees in the form of prescriptions in books. If you redefine content from a COP perspective, then it not only includes expert knowledge, but also it encompasses practitioner-oriented and practitioner-produced content, like teachers' blogs, like teachers' podcasts, like practitioner journals, and even discussions in the classroom. So they, all these, are considered as content. Uh, basically, the uh, idea underlying this assumption is that expertise does not merely reside in the brain of a so-called expert. It's actually distributed among all members of a community. So in a teacher education course, the expert whose book is being taught and the teacher educator who gives lectures are not the only experts. That expertise is also distributed among teacher learners. That is why we should negotiate content. Um, to, to make that happen adequately, we should acknowledge teacher learners' share in the production and selection of classroom content. And uh, because we want them to contribute to the content, we should also provide them with useful guidelines that they can draw upon to be able to perform to fulfill this role. They should also be provided access to different types of content. And we should actually treat the content they produce as worth serious 
attention and consideration, like we do the expert produced knowledge. But negotiation of content should not happen just at the stage of selecting it. It should also be carried on to the stage of critical engagement with content. So let's imagine we ask them to bring content to the classroom. So for example, they bring an article from a certain journal to the classroom. That is part of negotiation. But negotiation of meaning from a COP perspective does not stop there. It also encourages us to critically reflect on the produced and selected content. That can happen through critical literacy. But the issue sometimes is that there are some people who are not that willing to do that. They just want to take in and internalize some transferred knowledge, and they're happy with that. So we should actually be able to encourage them to do so. And that happens in an atmosphere of support, respect, and critical dialogue. Basically, what can happen in critical engagement with and critical reflection upon content is that we can ask student teachers to individually and collectively evaluate the logic behind the issues raised in the content, to problematize concepts and issues raised in that content, to appraise its validity and its applicability to their local context of teaching and culture, and to actually take informed action based on that reflection in their own practice as teachers. So, so far, I've talked about content of teacher education in reification terms. Now, I'm going to talk about participation and how it can inform activities, teacher learners or student teachers, I use them interchangeably, how participation can inform activities they are involved in in the teacher education course. I put engagement, imagination, and alignment under participation because th these are three modes of identification or identification that Wenger talks about and says that, well, engagement in community practice through mutual engagement, imagination, and alignment contributes to members' identity construction. He defines engagement as active involvement in mutual process of negotiating meanings, that is, experience and ideas. It also involves imagination, that is, we create images of the world beyond the community we are directly and immediately involved in. And we do this through connections across time and space based on our experiences. We should also get involved in the process of alignment, which would be coordinating our energy and activities in order to fit within broader structures. I'm going to talk about each of these in detail now. For engagement to happen adequately, there should be a climate of trust. Trust of two types. Trust that each member has the ability to contribute to the process of negotiating meanings and identity construction because they've got valuable ideas and experiences to share with others. We should also have trust in the potential of the interactions which happen between members of a community to contribute to the process of identity formation. In service teachers who participate in teacher education programs are already teachers, right? So they've got their own experience of having taught which they can bring to the classroom. But this does not mean that pre-service teachers who lack that experience cannot be trusted. Well, the thing is, those who haven't taught have gone through years of schooling. So they have seen how other people teach and they have developed your own understanding of what good teaching is, what bad teaching is. This is sometimes referred to as apprenticeship of observation. So all these people, regardless of whether the program is in service or pre-service, should be trusted and as a result engaged in the process of negotiating meanings on identity construction. Engagement also involves mutuality. Well, the thing is, in a teacher education course, we draw upon what we conventionally call expert knowledge, right? We uh, bring textbooks to the classroom and we ask teacher learners to reflect on them.
but we just ask them to reflect on them, not necessarily accept the ideas there. Expert knowledge which is produced in textbooks is usually called the competence of a community. What Wenger argues is that members of a community should not just comply with that confidence, with that competence, sorry. They should also contribute to its transformation through sharing their own experiences, which may sometimes be more valid than the competence presented in those textbooks. So when it comes to fostering mutuality and engagement, meanings produced by a member should be recognized and acknowledged, acknowledged as probably valid and at least worth serious consideration. The literature on teacher education shows that this happens through what we usually call teacher collaboration. People have observed that mutuality is facilitated through collaborative tasks like cooperative learning, professional learning communities, peer placements, and co-teaching. Engagement should also involve celebrating and respecting diversity of perspectives rather than mere compliance with expert knowledge. So meanings produced by teacher learners should be regarded as maybe equally legitimate. For this to happen, a dialogical atmosphere is necessary. We can also promote a culture of critical friendship, and we can also adopt a problem-posing approach to teacher education so that multiplicity of perspectives is welcomed and built on. Those who attend a teacher education course are already members of other communities, which may not be necessarily educational. They are already members of a community called family. They might be working in a certain workplace, be it educational, industrial, or something else. They may even belong to a political association or an academic institution. If a teacher education course is going to be an adequate space for their identity construction, it should not deny their membership in those multiple communities. Actually, it should acknowledge their different experiences, the experiences they gain from their membership in those communities. And because there are differences between the teacher education course and all those communities, tensions may arise. So in a teacher education course, conscious attempts should be made to reconcile those tensions so that the process of identity construction does not get stifled. While it is important to acknowledge teacher learners' membership in multiple communities, that is perhaps not enough. We should also encourage interactions between the community of teacher education course and other communities. For example, if we have a pre-service teacher education course, we can ask them to do joint projects with participants in an in-service course of a similar kind of area. Or we can ask them to collaborate with other pre-service teachers from other areas. So that was about engagement. Engagement is about direct interactions between members of a community or between teacher learners who participate in a teacher education course. But that is not where Wenger stops. He says, that it is just not about a community of practice and how it performs that members would be able to construct their identities effectively. It's also about how that community of practice places itself in the wider landscape and in its interactions with other communities of practice. So here we should talk about something beyond engagement. Because engagement in a community of practice may guarantee that teacher learners will develop the competence established in that community of practice. That is, for example, the knowledge that is presented to teacher learners by the teacher educator. However, that competence does not guarantee their claim of ownership over knowledge, which is what a landscape, that is, the interactions among communities of practice, might require.
So there should be an interaction between the community of practice and the wider landscape. That can happen through imagination. You might have heard of imagined communities. We just do not belong to a teacher education course. We belong to a wider community of teachers in general. And we are not necessarily directly um, interacting with all of, all of the members in that landscape. That is how Wenger highlights the significance of imagination in the process of identity construction. He says, and I quote, identification depends on the kind of picture of the world and of ourselves we can build. It depends on the connections we can envision across history and across the social landscape. Through these connections, identification expands through time and space, and our identities take on new dimensions. So imagination results in an expansiveness of identity. Imagination, more precisely, involves reflection on who we are, that is what our position is in the world, or in the wider community of uh, teaching profession, for example. Where we come from, that is our historical background. Who we could be, that is what alternative paths we could have taken, or we should have taken, or we just simply would take. And where we can go, that is the possibilities that have not been realized yet, but we can help materialize. Studies show that teacher imagination can be facilitated, facilitated through different teacher education activities like reflective writing, action research, and involvement in lesson studies. But it is not just about imagination, because imagination is still imagination. We need to go beyond what we imagine and see how we can actually, in practice, um, have interactions with the wider community or the landscape. Wenger proposes the concept of alignment to talk about that kind of thing. If you, if you remember from the issue of mutuality under engagement, there I argued that there should be an interaction between the experience of members and the competence established in a community. That is, instead of requiring teacher learners to merely comply with the competence established, that is with the knowledge within a community, they should also be encouraged to contribute to it through voicing their, their own opinions and showing how logical and maybe sometimes more logical their own ideas are than some scholars. The same should happen in their interactions with the wider landscape. That is where alignment comes in. So alignment is not just about teacher learners aligning themselves with established curriculum and policies. It's also about them contributing to refinement of those policies. But how does alignment contribute to teacher education? Well, the thing is, as a result of my review of the literature on the interplay between teacher autonomy and agency and the dominant structure, I realized that there is a bit of a lack of balance in the literature. For example, in the literature on curricular alignment, there is so much emphasis on teachers' accountability and conformity to policies to the point of excluding their autonomy and their voice. Those who have criticized this literature have denied teacher agency in a different way. They have so much focused on the effects of policies on teachers' agency that they have, they have in a subconscious way, of course, presented teachers as helpless victims, as those who just cannot do anything to transform the status quo. Critical pedagogy, however, presents teachers as transformative intellectuals and cultural workers and those who can emancipate the world and everything. However, still it fails to actively highlight the significance of teachers' minimum alignment with established curriculum so that they can later on serve as transformative intellectuals. So basically the idea in, align in alignment as conceptualized by Wenger is that if you want to transform the situation, you should first be able to participate in the activities which are established, which are already established, so that everyone considers you as a legitimate participant. Then you can change the dynamics. There are a few studies in the literature which have focused on 
the two-way nature of alignment. Roberts and Graham, for example, um, studied how student teachers can try to fit in early in their placement, but the purpose of the purpose of doing so has not been to assimilate norms only, but to attain some autonomy so that later on they can transform the established dynamics. Or Robinson, for example, observed that primary school teachers in Australia did a combination of adopting and adapting curricular requirements. So it was not just about them transforming everything, neither was it about them conforming to everything. It was a combination, which is what Wenger is trying to say. So um, what I've tried to do in this presentation is to argue that if we adopt a COP or a community, community of practice perspective to teach our education, then we can sort of facilitate teacher education as a space for teacher learners' identity construction. Um, my discussion of reification and participation in engagement, imagination, and alignment showed that this way of looking at teacher education can develop it into a space where teacher learners' identity is constructed as a negotiated experience as their membership in the community of teacher education and the wider community, as a learning trajectory, and as a nexus of multiple membership, that is a membership in multiple communities they belong to, and as a relation between the local community of teacher education and the global landscape of the whole profession and society. Thank you very much for listening. I would be happy to actually receive your comments and question via email.